Okay, this is the Korean War. Uh, this is from your Cold War notes. Um, call this Section 2 or Section 3. Uh, I know it says Section 2 on the slides, but it may say Section 3 on your paper. Uh, but either way, Korean War. Alright, if you remember from last week, we talked about um, some things that kind of happened at the end of World War II, wrapping up the end of the Second World War, what Europe looked like, what the, um, the, the winning countries kind of had to do to divide it up. And one of the things we talked about was the Chinese Civil War that had been going on before World War II started. Um, once World War II was over, the Chinese Civil War kind of started back up again. So, before China or before Japan invades China in 1937 during World War II, uh, the Nationalist, led by Chiang Kai-shek, had been fighting a civil war in China against the Communists, led by Mao Zedong. And so that, like I said, war resumes when World War II ends. The Soviet Union was supporting Mao and the Communists, and the United States was supporting. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. When I say supporting, I mean money. Uh, at this point in, in U.S. history, we're trying to, once again, avoid sending actual troops to foreign countries to fight wars. Now, we are going to talk about us failing in that today and, and going and fighting in the Korean War, uh, but our, our goal, at least early on in the, in the Cold War, was to try to provide aid, try to find money, uh, to send to countries that were trying to avoid becoming communist. And so we saw this as, as a good thing to do. Uh, it creates goodwill with that country. We were trying to contain communism. And if you don't allow it to spread to another country, that's containing it. Um, so that's what we were attempting. However, Chiang Kai-shek was not a great leader. Um, we'll kind of run into this again a little bit later on when we get to Vietnam. I was, I was kind of dealing with some leaders of countries that we don't necessarily agree with, um, and so we decide, anyway, we're, we're still sending the money in 1948, Mao and the communists were clearly dominating the war, uh, and Chiang Kai-shek was asking for, for military support now, not just money, uh, we say no, and so by 1949, uh, Mao Zedong had, had won the war, uh, and turned China into People's Republic of China, uh, the Nationalists fled to Taiwan, and that actually was the China that the United States recognized, the island of Taiwan, for a very long time. Uh, and so now that, that the Communists have won in China, Communism exists on a quarter of the world's land masses and ruled over a third of the world's population. Once controlled by Japan, switching gears back to Korea, uh, Korea had been divided into two countries after World War II, uh, dividing lines set at the 38th parallel. So we talked about East and West Germany the last week, right? Dividing Germany up into two separate countries, with East Germany becoming a country, West Germany becoming non-communist. They do the same thing in Korea, but instead of East and West, it's North and South. Um, so the dividing line here set at the 38th parallel. North Korea uh, set up with the help of the Soviet Union, a communist government. In South Korea, uh, we set up a non-communist government. U.S. troops occupied South Korea in 1949, and as soon as we leave, the North Korean forces attack across the 38th parallel. So we have to go back. Truman wastes no time in sending aid to South Korea, uh, as did the U.N. Security Council. Had the Soviet Union been at that Security Council meeting, they probably would have vetoed it, but they weren't there. Another thing here, this this is key, Truman did not wait for Congress to formally declare war uh, because of the UN's declaration of war, and he sent U.S. troops to Japan without congressional approval. Other presidents will do this in the future because of Truman doing it here. Uh, it kind of rewrites the rules a little bit, unintentionally, I think, Truman. I don't think he was trying to make a big statement. Um, but kind of rewrites the rules of what presidents can and can't do when it comes to committing troops to a war. In September of 1950, the UN forces were ready to counterattack, and General Douglas MacArthur had a bold plan to drive the invaders from South Korea. MacArthur gets there first when it comes to sending U.S. troops, because he had been in Japan. Uh, he was in Japan after World War II. We sent him there to help set up a government there. 
Japan is very close to Korea, so we just sent him from Japan to Korea, so that's why he's there so early. Uh, he believed that since the North Korean troops had quickly left North Korea, they probably left it unguarded, and so he wanted to not only force the communists back into North Korea, but kind of go behind enemy lines, if you will, uh, attack the port of engine, you'll see it on a map on the next slide, um, and push them not just across the 38th parallel, but very far into North Korea. Uh, and that's something Truman did not want him to do. Truman's policy when it came to the Cold War overall, and really war overall, if you kind of look at his policies going back to World War II, was a policy of limited warfare. And that just did not compute MacArthur's brain. This is a guy that was a World War II legend. He was in charge of the Pacific Theater virtually for the entirety of World War II. Um, he was prepared at the end of World War II to invade Japan, you know, with, with infantry, with actual ground troops and not using um, uh, the atomic bombs, which is what we ended up doing. Um, but he, he was prepared. He was not afraid to, to take big risks in order to win big rewards. That's how he saw it. Risk, you know, going in, potentially invading China even, we could knock out communism in one fell swoop. That's kind of what he thought. Um, Truman told him no, and I don't think MacArthur was very used to hearing the word no, uh, and he did not agree with Truman. And so instead of just listening and doing what he said, um, he actually sent a letter to the House Republican leader. Um, Truman is a Democrat, so this would be the opposite party leader, uh, attacking Truman's policies, and Truman was pretty angry. <laughs> MacArthur had gone behind his back. Remember, the president's the commander-in-chief. doesn't matter how high-ranking of a general you are, he's still the president. Um, and he fired uh, MacArthur for doing that. And that was something that was the right thing to do if you really look at the situation. But as far as Truman's popularity, it did not make him look good. And it really shot any chance he had at winning the 1952 presidential election, which I think he would have lost anyway because he was running against Eisenhower. Um, so I don't think he would have won, but it kind of ended it right there for him. All right. Uh, American fighting in Korea. It's kind of a timeline and some maps for you. So North Korea invades South Korea in June of 1950. The war, as far as the fighting, is basically over a year later. The war is not officially over until 1953, but the actual fighting is over in, in June of 1951. Uh, on the little map on the right side of the, of the slide, you can see the yellow. That's how far the communists got on that first one on the left. Um, before we get there, push them back. You can see how far MacArthur actually ended up pushing them back, right to the border with China. And then the very last one there on the right, uh, back at the 38th parallel, which is where the dividing line still is between North and South Korea. Like I said, by 1951, um, the Allies had regrouped, stabilized their positions near the 38th parallel, and the war reached a stalemate, and it lasted for two years, basically. That stalemate becomes a key issue in the presidential election of 1952 as well. So it's something that Dwight Eisenhower can say, hey, if I'm elected, I'm going to end the war. And of course people believe him, because A, not even Truman failed to, to end the war, so why not try someone else? It just so happens that that someone else you could give a try is the guy that ended the war in Europe. Uh, during World War II, the guy that successfully planned D-Day, you know, the World War II hero, Dwight D. Eisenhower. How do you not kind of elect someone to end a war for you and also be the president of the United States? I mean, it, it was almost too easy of a victory for him. He visited Korea after he won the election. We'll talk about the election um, in, a, in our next uh, section of those. He promised that he views it, like I said, he visits Korea becomes convinced that only strong action would break the stalemate, and so he actually ends up threatening to use nuclear weapons, which is something Truman said he would never do, and I think that's understandable as well, because he's the only president who has, and I think that that is something that probably haunted him a little bit, uh, knowing the death and devastation he caused in a very quick moment of just dropping a bomb. Um, 
I think that's why he's so hesitant to use it again. Uh, whereas Eisenhower hadn't. And I'm not saying that he would have actually ended up using it. I, I think he knew that they would agree to the, to the peace settlement. Um, and, they, and they signed that in June or July of, uh, of 1953. All right. Effects of it. Lasting effects of it. Uh, there was no victory in the Korean War, but there wasn't really a loss either. North Korea remained communist and allied to China. The South Koreans uh, remained non-communist and allied to the United States. The divide decline remained at the 38th parallel. Truman did commit troops to Korea without congressional approval. I told you that would be something uh, that would be a pretty big effect going forward. It led to a very large increase in military spending. By 1960, half of the federal budget was just for military spending. Um, another thing that comes out of the Korean War being fought, this probably would have come about anyway, um, was the creation of CETO, or the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Think NATO, right? North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but just a different part of the world. So this is a defensive alliance aimed at preventing the spread of communism. It includes different countries uh, like the Philippines. Those think Southeast Asian, South Asian countries, right? Uh, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, but then also France, Britain, the United States. Um, so some of the bigger countries uh, that are also in the UN. Immediate effects of the Korean War. Uh, this is sometimes called the Forgotten War uh, in U.S. history, sadly, um, because 54,000 Americans are killed, 103,000 Americans are wounded fighting this war. Uh, our relations with China got worse because of the, the conflict uh, on the border there with, with North Korea and China. Um, something Truman uh, should get credit for, he kind of has become the forgotten president almost, um, in some cases, is he integrated the military. This is the first war that we fought with the racially integrated military. Uh, so who goes to Truman for that? Uh, and really, it's something the military can, can definitely brag about the United States. It's one of the di most diverse places in the United States that you can work is the U.S. military um, in any branch, really. Uh, something to keep in mind. Military spending increases, worldwide military commitments increase. So this is just the first uh, stop on the United States Cold War military tour. We're going to be involved in, in other military conflicts during the Cold War as well. Uh, our relations with Japan improve, and then, like I said, future presidents are going to end up sending the military into combat without congressional approval first. Okay. That really wraps up the Korean War as far as these notes go. There will be some video, uh, some videos that I post to go along with this on Google Classroom. Um, if I've also included an assignment for you, that'll be in the announcements on Google Classroom, so just pay attention to, to what I put there. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always email me.